All right, Rattler, so we've got a reticulated python up in this tree on the edge of this river here. Here it comes. I got him, I got him, I got him, I got him. There you go. Oh. <laughs> I got him. Okay, okay. Woo! <laughs> Oh, man. I'm Dave Kaufman, and I tour the world to see how reptiles are living in the wild. And while I'm at it, checking out some of the most amazing facilities and reptile expos as well. It's all about learning, appreciation, and conservation. So come with me and join my reptile adventures. At Rainbow Mealworms, we grow all our insects 100% naturally so that you get the freshest, most lively feeders on the market. So for all your reptile food needs, place your order today at rainbowmealworms.net. Hey, what's up, Rattlers? So I don't need to tell you that retics are becoming more and more popular all the time. There are more and more morphs that are just popping up, that are just jaw-dropping. And at expos like this one here in Anaheim, California, which is the Reptile Super Show, and at expos all over the world, man, you just see some of the most incredible retics. Check these out. Retics getting more and more popular all the time. It really makes me wonder, how are retics living in the wild? So to answer that question, I've got an idea here. Uh, you, uh, you guys want to go to Thailand and find retics and other cool stuff in the wild? Oh, yes. Hell yeah, we're down. Sweet. Alright, so after switching planes in Seattle, we finally arrived here in Korea. Uh, South Korea. What the hell is this thing? Rocky 3? Quit following me. Quit, quit following me. Anyway, we've got two more flights from here until we're in the habitat of the retics. All right, so after I don't even know how many hours, we have finally arrived here in Bangkok. This airport is a zoo, but Dan and Apple are already around here somewhere. We have one more flight until we're down where the retics are. So this is the habitat of the reticulated python here in Thailand, and Thailand is shaped like an elephant, so where we are now is right at the tip of the elephant's trunk down on the Malaysian border. This is known as the Isthmus of Kra, and it is the oldest forest in the world. This is a 160 million year old forest, which means that the dinosaurs lived and thrived in this forest, and now the reticulated python lives and thrives in this forest as the apex predators that they are. All right, so the quickest and easiest way to see retics in the wild is to get on these boats right over here and cruise down the river because all the retics are arboreal and they're gonna be hanging in the trees right above the river. All right, Apple gets her own boat. Dan gets his own boat. This one's mine. That one's Jeff's. Oh yeah. All right, I'm going in this one. All right. 
I'm always careful, even when I'm not. All right, so we're in these inflatable rafts. We're heading down the river, and uh, hopefully we're gonna see some reticulated pythons down here. So we've got a reticulated python up in this tree on the edge of this river here and our guides are up there and they're going to clear a path so that we can make an attempt to uh, get him out of that tree and take a better look at him. Alright, so he's up in this tree here. Dan has positioned himself in the water over here. I'm on the land. We're going to see where this guy's going to come down. There he is, there he is, there he is. Oh, nice yeah. catch, Dan! Yeah. In there! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Fantastic! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Yeah, he is gorgeous. All right, Rattlers, so we got him out of the tree. Dan made a miraculous midair catch, but this is what the retics look like in this region. Sometimes they have those really bright lemon banana yellow heads. This one kind of doesn't. This one is really typical coloration of a retic found in this area, but you know, it's really difficult to tell the age of this snake by its size because it's a wild snake. But what I do want you to see is how thin this snake is. Reticulated pythons out here in the wild, they're actually lean snakes. They're not these big, fat snakes that we're kind of used to seeing in herpticulture. They're actually really long, thin pythons. And this is an extremely healthy size for a reticulated python of this guy's age and this guy's size. Look at that iridescence that he has, and that is one of the signs of a very healthy snake. If this was not a healthy snake out here, you wouldn't have that iridescence. It would be dull and drab coloring, but this is a perfectly healthy, wild reticulated python. So, as you can see, this guy has some very formidable teeth. So we're gonna let him go here and hope that I don't get clipped. But if I do, you know what? No big deal. All right, you ready? Yeah, One, two, okay. I'm gonna hold them like this. Three, woo! <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. What a gorgeous snake. Okay, you guys, so normally in the past, I've tried to release these snakes back up into the trees and they just instantly drop back down into the water because they feel so secure in the water. So I think I'm just gonna point him towards the shore there. He's probably gonna swim off into the water quite fast. They submerge as well. The mangrove snakes, when they drop into the water, they float, but the retics just instinctually just go straight down. I'm gonna try to yeah, get him here, but he's probably gonna go right into the water towards Apple's feet. Yeah. It's okay, retics don't eat apples. I'm just gonna let his tail go. He's gonna go wherever he goes, okay? Off he goes. See his foot, he tickles. Look at that, completely submerged and disappeared. Yep. So anybody that's kept retics knows that the retics appetite is legendary. Out here, a big 15 footer can take down a deer, but to be honest, that very rarely happens because if a big snake takes down a big animal and swallows it, that snake is immobile for as long as it's going to take to digest that huge meal. So they're not eating huge meals out here in the wild very often. And so therefore, the snakes that we're keeping in herpticulture, they are really obese. The snakes do not get that big and fat out here in the wild. So a good rule of thumb for you to feed your retics is to choose an appropriate sized meal that's about the size of the thickest part of your snake. So the idea of power feeding retics to get them to a breeding size faster, listen, that does not work, and it's really detrimental to the health of your snake. 
a slow and steady process of feeding appropriate sized meals and letting them reach that breeding age naturally is the best thing for that snake and they're going to in the long run have bigger healthier clutches than they do if you power feed them to try to get them to that breeding size quicker. <laughs> We've got yet another retic over in this tree. <laughs> this is awesome. All right. We have a retic and a mangrove. Thailand rules. And, oh, that's a big retic too. Okay, so we're going to make an attempt to get the retic out of the tree. Dan is in position. Jeff, Apple. I am standing in a current and I have no footing. Here it comes. I got him, I got him, I got him, I got him. There we go. Oh. <laughs> I got him. Okay. Woo! <laughs> oh man. Those rocks are slippery. Yeah, they are. <laughs> and I was standing in a current and I couldn't move, yeah. but. Oh, we got him. All right. He's about the same size as the last one. Yep, not as light. Uh uh. Oh, he is ornery. All right, so we got this guy out of that tree. This is another retic, about the same size as the first one but similar coloration just man these are beautiful snakes here in thailand so if you notice where we're finding these snakes we are finding these snakes up in the trees these are completely arboreal at this size they do come down out of the trees of course but for the most part these are completely arboreal snakes especially at this size you get a big 15 footer they're going to be moving around on the ground they're not going to be as arboreal as these smaller ones are these are not really the terrestrial snakes that we kind of believe that they are so guys what i'm about to say is going to be controversial and i know the comments are going to blow up about it but listen you know if you have a retic that's a adult female that's a big 15 footer Putting that snake in a cage that's 10 foot by 2 foot by 3 foot, I know that's kind of the industry standard, but it's not ideal for the snake. Putting a giant retic in those kinds of enclosures are convenient for us. They are not convenient for the snake. They need taller cages with lots of places to climb. And when you go to an expo to buy a baby snake, before you purchase that baby retic, you have to have a long-term plan for these retics. They will grow big, they will grow fast, and pretty soon that baby is going to be a 10 foot snake that you have to have a plan in place before you buy that snake for that snake's well-being. Also, obviously, we are finding all of these snakes very close to water sources. So when you keep retics in that enclosure, it's not enough just to have a water dish for them. They need to not only soak, but they need to swim. You need to have a big enough enclosure that has a big enough water basin so that they can move around in that water basin if you wanna mimic what is actually happening out here in the wild in Thailand. So it comes right down to the question, are you keeping the retic in a manner that's convenient for you? or are you gonna keep the retic in a matter that's convenient for the retic? So when you design your retic enclosures, especially for a retic this size, don't make them smaller like three feet high, like we're used to seeing retics being kept in. Make them taller, give them places to climb up on. These snakes need to feel secure, and a snake this size, even though this is an apex predator out here, they still need to feel that security and where a snake this size feels the most secure is not necessarily in a hide box, it's up in the trees where they can feel secure. So again, tall enclosures with a lot of branches so that your retic can climb and feel secure. So the last time we were in Thailand, we found a 15 foot retic and what that 15 foot retic was doing, it was crammed into a hole that it barely fit into. And my theory as to why these giant apex predators need to cram into holes that they can feel all sides of the hole on their body and they need that security is, listen, these snakes started out as babies. And when they're babies, they are on the bottom of the food chain. And they carry that kind of fear of 
I'm exposed out here, I'm gonna get eaten out here. They carry that fear into adulthood. And even when they become 15 foot apex predators out here, they are still feeling that need for security. So not only should you have a water source in your enclosures that these snakes can move around in, not just soak, but you also need hide boxes, including hide boxes big enough for those adult females that reach 15 feet plus. Otherwise, they're just going to sit in their enclosure and they're going to feel exposed. They're not going to feel secure. So if you notice right here, there are two ticks right on the top of his head and external parasites are a real problem for these wild retics. So I'm just gonna pluck these right out of his head for him. There we go. There we go. Poor guy doesn't have hands or opposable thumbs. He can't pluck those out by himself. But this is just a beautiful retic that has that classic wild retic coloration that you find here in Thailand. So reticulated pythons aren't strictly diurnal. Most of their activity is actually at night, but they will be active during the day as we're seeing out here. So this is where we caught the reticulated pythons, and so I'm going to take a temperature and a humidity reading right here on this spot where they were hanging out. So the humidity level is about 60% relative humidity, and it's 31.8 degrees Celsius which is 89.2 degrees Fahrenheit. So for your retic enclosures at home, this gives you a basic idea of what the relative humidity and the temperature that these wild retics here in Thailand are living in. So because reticulated pythons are also active at night as well as during the daytime, so I'm gonna take a temperature and humidity reading to show what the low temperature and humidity is at night here where retics live. So take a look at that humidity. It's 90% humidity here at night. So here in the jungles of Thailand, the humidity is much higher during the night than it is during the day because the sun isn't out to burn off the humidity. So where retics live and are active at night, they are active at 90% humidity and the temperature is 23 degrees Celsius which is 73 degrees Fahrenheit. So that means that the retics are out here and active in this environment in about the mid 70s and again at 90% humidity. So it might be a good idea to give your retics a little bit of a night drop in temperature, but also give them a misting in the evening right before lights out to increase that humidity in their enclosures at night to better replicate what's happening out here in the wilds in Thailand. <laughs> There's a discussion out there that in order to cure your retic of its food response, you should take the retic out of its enclosure to feed it in a separate enclosure. And I don't know where that came from, but I'm telling you, it is total BS. It absolutely does not work. If you want to cure your retic of that food response, you have to work with it appropriately. What I do with my retics at home is when I open their enclosures, I will just take the tip of a snake hook and simply touch it to the top of their heads to let them know that it is not feeding time. Don't use a hemostats to do that because you're feeding them with the hemostats and they're gonna see that or smell that and think that it's feeding time. So that's one way to work with your retics to cure them of that food response that they are so known for. And it's gonna take some time to basically train your retic for lack of a better word on breaking that food response every time you open that enclosure. And you should be working with your retics at least 20 minutes a day, opening the enclosure, touching them on the top of the head with the hook to let them know that it's not feeding time, taking them out of the enclosure and working with them. And do that about 20 minutes a day. And when you work with them during this 20 minutes a day, longer is better, but at least 20 minutes a day. And when you work with them during this 20 minutes, never feed them for a couple hours after you do that so that they don't associate the enclosure opening with feeding time. So Rattlers, I absolutely love Thailand. This is my second trip out here and there's definitely 
definitely going to be a third because there are so many awesome herps out here that we have yet to find. But I hope that this video has given you some insight into how to better care for retics. And listen, reticulated pythons are not for everybody. They get huge, they require specialized care, and they require a lot of space. And if you're not willing to give these giant snakes the space that they need, maybe another species might be better for you. But if you have the space and you have the desire to care for such a giant snake, well, reticulated pythons are really rewarding snakes to work with. So anyway, Rattlers, as with all my In the Wild videos, comment below and share a tip or a technique on how you guys care for your retic so that other people can learn from you as well. And our Thailand adventures is just beginning. So hit that subscribe button when you do hit that bell so you do not miss one of these uploads from here in Thailand. And until the next reptile adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on.